All right, we got about 20 more minutes left uh, of service, and uh, so we're going to uh, finish up the sermon that we started last week. I didn't get a chance to get through everything, uh, but I think this is Soul Food Part 2. So turn with us to Isaiah chapter number 55 is where we're going to head, and uh, we'll uh, continue to think a little bit uh, prayerfully together about what does it mean for you and I to engage in a soul food diet. Amen. Isaiah chapter 55. The, if you need a Bible, shoot your hand up. Uh, we do have the words on the screen as well if you'd like to follow along there. And uh, I believe that the scriptures can bring us so much direction in this season and moment. As you're preparing to get your uh, scripture together, uh, Isaiah, uh, the prophet, major prophet, one of the big prophets, uh, was writing to the community of Israel living in the post-exile of Babylon. And the role of the prophet simply was to bring the children of Israel, God's people, back into covenant relationship. That God always has somebody uh, around you that can remind you what you're supposed to be doing. Because how many know it's easy to forget what we're supposed to be doing? And so God will always put someone there in, in, in the 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 culture of Israel and the Jewish people, that was the role of the prophet. And Isaiah uh, was fulfilling his role, writing uh, to the children of Israel as they came out of bondage from Babylon. And uh, last week, uh, we started off this series uh, looking at the scriptures that said, Ho, or listen to everyone who is hungry, come and eat, buy milk and drink, you that have no money, come and get it without price. Why do we spend our money on that which does not satisfy and our bread for that which does not fulfill? We spent a lot of time speaking on these things. We didn't get to the second half of the chapter, so I thought we'd jump into that a little bit. So we'll start at verse number six. When you have it, say, I got it. All right, the word of God, Isaiah 55, verse number six. Seek God while God is here to be found. Pray to God while God is close at hand. Let the wicked abandon their way of our soul force, unleashing our soul force. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, let the people of God say amen, amen. Uh, this Sunday is actually the second Sunday in the liturgical calendar uh, during a season that is known as Epiphany. And uh, if any of you uh, have taken the GRE or, you know, got a nice vocabulary, you know that Epiphany, uh, I mean, you know, maybe, or maybe it is used more commonly than... Uh, then I give it credit for it. But uh, many of us know that epiphany is uh, denoting when we come into a revelation. One may even say that uh, when the light comes on and you get an epiphany, uh, some information that you did not previously have is all of a sudden invading your mind. It is a surprise of sorts. It is something you did not expect, but that knowledge and information has a radical interruption and change in your way of thinking and being in the world. If we were to look deeper into the biblical text during this epiphany season, there are all kinds of texts that talk about how the light of God is shining, and we as God's people ought to carry that light with us so we can, in many respects, light up the places where the light of God is absent. Epiphany. And I want to submit that when you and I follow Jesus well, we can be the source of so many people's epiphanies. That we can, in many respects, help lighten up the lives, not through the power of our own light, but through the source of light that shines through us 
that emanates from the life of God whose light never grows dim. Now, it's so important for you and I to appreciate what an epiphany is not. Because we are now living in a season and time where uh, new information, whether we want to experience or hear about it or not, is now flooding all of our senses. Uh, I, 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 I am uh, so much uh, 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 bothered by the many ways that uh, we are in an age of propaganda where the truth is so uh, 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 muddled, <laughs> thank you, Jesus, <laughs> that, that, that people feel like they have an epiphany, but they can't tell if it's an epiphany that is causing life or death. I was deeply uh, 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 flabbergasted by the way our news media, and dare I say all of us, are being gaslighted continuously by this new political uh, monster who uh, won the election uh, of the President of the United States. And it's so fascinating because uh, it is giving me an epiphany, the kind I don't want. Amen. It is helping me to appreciate that there are some things in my soul that I must continue to work out or I may become victimized, dare I say hijacked, dare I say taken on a ride to a place that I know I don't want to go. I know God is not trying to take us there. And I certainly believe that we, the people who follow the ways of God in the world, uh, must figure out a way to distinguish between the light of God's truth and the propaganda of this fallen world. This is where and why I believe the voices of folk like Dr. Martin Luther King and so many others are so important because they are, in many respects, our contemporary Isaiah. They are our prophets that continue to remind us that we have a higher calling than the calling of that which we are constantly being seduced and invited to participate in. And the calling we have does not abdicate us from our stewardship responsibilities to be light and salt, if you will, to be the, the voice of, 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 of hope and healing, to be the agents of reconciliation and hope and healing in the world. But you and I must always be reminded that our catalyst can't be the propaganda of a Trump or a CNN or a Jay-Z or Beyonce or whoever has a good, you know, kind of, uh, influence in your life so much so that when God starts speaking, you can't hear God because you hear all these other voices. Because mm -hmm. it's easy, you know, problematize, you know, the folk you don't like. But it's harder to get the folk you like out your ear enough so you can hear the voice of God who is always calling you and I into the work of our soul. Make no mistake, we must pay attention to soul work or we will be seduced by the vulnerabilities of our human weaknesses. You and I are not exempt just because we are good people. Because everybody in their own eyes, maybe except for a few of us, would identify themselves as good people. How many of you know folk who feel like they are good people? but they just full of the devil. Amen. And you, it's just like, you. <laughs> I didn't think the devil existed until I met you. Praise God. Amen. No. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. I don't mean no harm. I, I was, when I was pointing, it was just a, it was a, not a specificity point. It was the generality point. Mm-hmm. Tell your neighbor, being good ain't good, ain't good enough. Amen. God is calling you and I to be 
more than that. And that kind of work is work that happens in our soul. Because the soul is the core of who you are. You see, when, when you and I are trying to get in shape and we're trying to do our work, it's important to appreciate that there is indeed the core of your body that if you exercise the most, everything else will start to feel relief. I was having a little bit of problems with my feet and my back and my neck, my neck and my back, oh my, right? I mean, it was just, you know, a turn for a certain age and I just... <laughs> It was, it was a struggle. And the doctor said, what you need to do is work on your core. Because if you work on your core, your neck and your back and your feet won't hurt as much. I said, well, cool. But I realized that core work ain't no joke, praise God. Oh, I love to lift weights, barbells. Oh, I do that all day. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I love to do them, them things where, you know, you, what's that? You sit down on the thing and you work out your hamstrings and, and I love to do all that stuff. But then you start working on the core. And uh, I, it just, it's a challenge. Well, keep it real. It's the same in your spiritual soul work. When I'm talking about us getting on a soul food diet, I'm talking about us doing soul work. You doing work that actually strengthens your core. And that core, my loved ones, must be strengthened for this season we're entering. We're not going to make it if we don't do the soul core work. We will be caught on the gaslighting epiphanies of a fallen world that is bipartisan, that is cross-cultural, that is both in the academy and in the school of hard knocks. But the core soul work that you and I must do is critical for our ability to unleash what I call not I, but Dr. King and others call the soul force. And I am convinced that there's an opportunity for we, the church, in this season and moment to do that kind of soul food, kind of appetite that creates space for the soul work that can unleash our soul force. Dr. King, uh, in one of these quotes, uh, he says that again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. And he is talking indeed about how they resist evil in the world. And yet I find this idea that there is a power and a force that we, the people of God, must pursue, or we ourselves will become the agents of that which we resist ourselves. That's why some of us are going to uh, Washington, D.C. to stand up against the death penalty. Because God says that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's what God said. I didn't say it because I... I you know, if you ask me when I'm not up here preaching, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Y'all say something, you know, thank God, Pastor Mike, ain't God, amen. We'd be in trouble. God says in Ezekiel chapter number 39, I, I, I'll tweet the ver right, right scripture out, but God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that all should repent, turn from their ways, and live. Now, if God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, how many of you know that we who follow God need to ask God to do the soul work in us? Because not all of us are there. Amen. Amen. Some folk do something to us, and we, we pray for justice. Right? Amen. And I'll just leave it right there. 
But isn't it interesting that when we do something to offend, we always pray for mercy. <laughs> I don't see too many of us when we in the wrong crying out for justice. We asking for mercy, grace, second chance, third chance, tenth chance, as many chances as I can get to get it right. So part of what I believe you and I must imagine if we're going to do this work of our soul, we have to imagine what kind of impact will the soul food, what is the criteria that the soul food will have on our lives so we can be readily able to do the work of the soul and unleash the soul force. The first thing that I think the scriptures say boldly is that if we are doing the the, or engaging in a diet of soul food, listen, it will always have us coming back for more. Everybody say, keep coming back, keep coming back. Verse number six and seven, it says, seek God while God may be found. Pray to God while God is close at hand. Let the wicked abandon their way of life, the evil their way of thinking, and let them come back to God. Now, if you have had a wonderful experience eating some food that is good to you, you will always go back for more. You may not go back for more at that exact seating because you don't want to be, you know, greedy and whatnot. Maybe. But if a restaurant has been good to you, you'll give it a great Yelp. My wife's the Yelp queen. You are. Don't you got like an elevated status on Yelp or something? <laughs> you, 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 you will make a mental note that I will what? Come back. What will it take? What kind of soul food are you consuming that it keeps driving you back to God? Jesus said it like this, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right things. In the, the ancient languages, righteousness and justice are the same word. So one could argue you should read it more like blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice for they shall be filled. Can you imagine that the work that God would do in our lives that keeps us coming back to God is about God doing and filling us up so wonderfully and, and, and transformatively that we are always coming back to God for more. I will not seek out a diet or a source that is not grounded and centered in God. I mean, we were just singing it. Everybody was crying and weeping from my heart to the heavens. Jesus be the sin. Woo, thank you, Jesus, for it's all about you until you get on your job. It's all about you. Until your money gets funny. <laughs> it's all about you until my candidate loses, until the races start running crazily, until someone calls me out my name. And then it ain't all about the Lord no more. <laughs> it's about somebody else, praise God. <laughs> How many of you know that Doing some soul work will allow us to have the core that you can resist falling into someone else's plan for your demise. Is our soul food driving us back to God for more soul work or is what we're consuming putting us in someone else's project? Which causes me, if you take this scripture very seriously, it says, let the wicked abandon their way. What kind of wickedness do you and I need to abandon for this soul work, 
for our soul food to really have its maximum impact. I love Simon Chan. He's an Asian theologian. I've been loving him ever since I was in undergrad. He describes sin in three ways. The sin within us, the sin around us, and the sin beyond us. The sin within us. That's all the stuff you and I struggle with. And I ain't got to give you no list. Amen. <laughs> you know, you know, give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I know my struggle. I don't need your help. Amen. I don't need, I don't need, I don't need none of your input on my struggle. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not proud of it, but I know what I struggle with every day. And that's why I'm here in this church. That's why I'm praying. That's why I'm in groups. That's why I'm in therapy, because I know my struggle. So don't be trying to read my struggle. Not discern. No, discern your own struggle. Leave my struggle alone. <laughs> don't talk to me about my struggle unless you're willing to walk with me for the rest of my life through my struggle. But I don't need no drive-by struggle <laughs> things. <laughs> struggle. I'm just giving you all. No, no, no. You keep your bullets and all your discernment to yourself. If you so full of discernment, look in the mirror and discern your own struggle and ask God to send some folk in your life that can walk with you around why you so mean. Mm -hmm. why, 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 why you give your body and your soul and your mind to people that will abuse it. Mm -hmm. uh, discern your own struggle. I don't mean no harm. I don't know why I'm talking to nobody about that. The sin within us. But then there's a sin around us. That's the systems, the injustice, the, 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 the fallenness, the human weakness of, of, of humanity and creation, the sin around us. Then there's a sin beyond us. That's the devil and all the devil's business. And believe the devil is real. Don't you get so educated and so thoughtful that you don't think there is evil in the world? It's here. But that evil cannot defeat the child of God, the people of God, who are developing a soul that is fueled and stabilized by the power and the soul food of God. So the question you got to ask yourself, what kind of, what kind of, what kind of wickedness must you and I abandon if we're going to unleash our soul force? Is your soul food compelling enough, whatever you are consuming, to keep having you come back to God? Or is it just this thing that is not very compelling? Because there is a practice of Christian faith that is not compelling. Hello, somebody. It can be, uh, if I were to pull Dietrich Bonhoeffer out the air, Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it cheap grace. You know, the kind of faith where you can just kind of come and dip your toe in it whenever you want, but it don't leave you transformed or challenged to change who you are, to change how the world is. You just eat there whenever you feel like it. I'm calling for us, the people of God in this season, how does this soul food make us so addicted to God's, God's meat and God's drink that I got to sit at this table? Even when the consecration is over, I got to keep living on a soul food diet. I'll give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I need this soul food. I need this soul food. I need this soul food. I got to keep coming back. The second thing that I think will be uh, an example or an expression of you having a soul food diet, uh, it will give you life-giving ingredients. I love verse number 12. It says that you will go out in joy and be led back in peace. What does it mean, my loved ones, for you and I to have the kind of, of engagement consistently with God where the life-giving ingredients of joy and peace and love 
The things that we heard Dr. King mention, the things that you and I know are reflective of the text of the life of Jesus that you and I must have access, not just to the life-giving ingredients, but they must become a part of our composition. Because, you know, when you eat food, it, you know, spreads throughout your body. That food don't just stay in your, in your stomach. Your body extracts all of the nutrients that are usable and fuel your body so you can carry out the tasks that you decide are necessary. In the New Testament... Galatians chapter number five, it is described, these life-giving ingredients, as the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, if you want a report card, on what is comprising you, this will be a good place to start. Because this is described as the fruit of the Spirit, meaning that the Spirit that is doing the work on your soul should bear these uh, manifestations. Let's read through that list again. Close your eyes and just think about it. Uh, think about the ones that say ding, 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 and the ones that say mm. love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Lord, help me today. Isn't it something that we live in a culture that, that, that does not call us forward consistently to embodying these life-giving ingredients? Well, pick and choose the one that makes us feel good at the moment. I'll love you if you love me back. I'll be gentle to you as long as you're gentle to me. I'll be faithful when it suits me. And I will have self-control when I do. <laughs> Lord, help us today. But isn't it something that the scriptures call you and I forward? To do and engage in a diet that reflects these kinds of of ingredients. My loved ones, one question I'll ask you, are peace and joy and other ingredients of the Spirit at work in your life? Are these the things that people would describe as indicative of our soul food diet? Or are we just, folk just can't tell. It's like, you on a consecration, I couldn't tell. You changed your diet, I couldn't tell. You look the same. You act the same. Your breath smell the same. Your everything about you is the same. Hello, somebody. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, back in the day when we used to fast, you know, they told you to carry around mints. You know, because, you know, your, your breath would come a little tart when you weren't eating all that deathly food. Ain't that something? That's what they told us, and it turned out to be true. So what parts of you are the same? And what parts of you need to be changed? My question to you are peace and joy and love and, and, and temperance and self-control. Are they at work in you during this season of our soul food diet? Or is that where we need God to unleash some soul force so we can get some different soul work happening? And then the last thing we'll... Say for today, I love this verse, verse number 13. We will be monuments to God, living and breathing existence or evidence of God. Your diet, your soul food will always make a memorable, 
a memorable impact on your life? How can our lives be a monument to the world that God is real? I was telling some folks, if you are an oppressed person living in the United States of America, the longer you wake up in the United States, you can easily be pushed to agnosticism and atheism. Hello, somebody. Because it's easy to see the evidence of evil that appears to be winning. And again, this was true before the outcome of this last election. There are many folk whose lives every day are being lived under such pressure and hopelessness and, and isolation and loneliness that they think that their lives are meaningless and that God has forgot about them. It may be even be some of us in this room today. That there are times where you feel like, man, what is this all for? Why am I going through all this work, both of my soul, my mind, my body, my spirit, when everything seems to be pointing in the losing direction? Could it be that part of our job and our work as God's people in the world is to be a shining monument that God is still working even in our most desperate and difficult situations. And it is not just a, a, a cliche, but I'm talking about some work that is so clear that people can't deny that had to be God. Wow, God hooked that up for you, huh? Because there was no other explanation. And see, part of what you and I as the church must imagine in this season is that God is calling us forward to be a living, breathing monument to what God has always said God was about. Salvation, liberation, healing, community, creation. That you and I, whether you're young or old, rich or poor, up or down, that there is a light that shines inside of us that is not predicated on our circumstance, but it is a reflection of the faithfulness of God in us, in the world, and in God's own plan. That God is going to do what God will do. The question is, will we be in on the doing with God? Lord, help me today. Will you and I be a, a partner with God in the world? Or will we be a bystander? Will we sit on the sidelines and act as if we don't know what the end has already been promised to us? That God said in the end, victory shall be yours. In the end, deliverance is coming. In the end, hope and healing. In the end, God says, I will do what I said I will do. And in this way, our lives then must be lived so memorable that people around us will never forget. Whether it's a singular encounter, whether it's a consistent encounter, man, I know that there was something reflected in the soul of that Christ follower, of that disciple of Jesus. I can't articulate all of it, but I know that when I ran across their space or when I saw how they went through the same thing I'm going through, because you following Jesus don't mean you exempt. You, you, you ain't floating through life without your feet touching the ground. You're going to cry, you're going to mourn, you're going to suffer. But just like Jesus on the cross when he was suffering, all those that crucified him 
looked and said at the end of his suffering, he must be the son of God. Lord, help me. Could it be that how you and I go through these moments, how we go through these moments, how we endure, how we treat those who we don't like, how we work for justice even in moments and situations that seem like we might as well throw in the towel. That how we work and move as a reflection of the work that God is doing inside of us can change and encourage and enlighten and empower and liberate those around us who can't see what we see, who don't know yet what we know, who can't fully grasp what we know to be true. That the God creator of the heaven and earth neither sleeps nor slumber. That no weapon that is formed against us will be able to prosper. That even if we walk through the fire, we will not be burned. If we go through the flood, the waters will not overtake us. Whew. I don't know about you, but God, I need you to do that so work in me. I need you, God, to work so well and much in me that my core is so tight that I will not be moved by my circumstances to the point of despair, to the point of faithlessness. But God, I'm going to stand and wait on your word to come to pass. And while I wait, I'm a work. While I wait, I'm a praise. While I wait, I'm a love. I'm a serve. I'm not going to wait with a newspaper and the remote control and my feet kicked up in the air. I'm going to wait and do God's work in me, in us, dare I say, in the world. So work, so food. Stand with us, everybody. Let's prepare to pray.